All right, it's me from the future. In today's video, I'm going to build a ST-536, a terrible Fire 536 adapted for the Atari ST. Myself, because I'm from the future, as you can see, everything worked out. There were There was lots of tense moments. There were lots of stressful moments, but it worked out in the end. Let's get to it. Greetings, and welcome to The Power of Vintage. I don't do this very often, where I'm actually retroactively looking backwards, but in this case, I, I didn't record ahead of time because honestly, I gave myself a 50-50 chance of actually any success whatsoever. So I am tickled that it all worked out. I do have some photographs that you'll, you'll see I'll voice over on some photographs as I went through the build process, <clears throat> as well as some of the troubleshooting that I, that I went through in order to get this thing functioning and working. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to work through this. And to be fair, the amount of troubleshooting they actually ended up doing was, wasn't as bad as I was expecting. The soldering, on the other hand, was just as stressful as I expected. But just a little bit about what is the ST-536. The ST-536, is an accelerator card based upon the TF-536, the Terrible Fire 536, that is used in the Amigas and has does have some Atari ROM, uh, firmware for it as well, but it's somewhat limited in its capability and there's, there's some compatibility using it with Atari's, the Terrible Fire 536. Sir, it's quite possible this asteroid is not entirely stable. So the ST-536 adapts that build for this, also adapts the firmware, and makes a few changes, tweaks here and there, especially with the ROMs, uh, TOS 2.06, in order to make this an awesome, stable experience. So that's the main difference. And it was done by Exos. Exos has done a fantastic job on this, him partnering with Terrible Fire to make this happen. Really, really cool thing. So join me as I narrate through some of the photos of the build process here. All right, the heart of this build and the first component I soldered to the board was the Xilinx chip. This has the, in my mind, the most challenging, was the most challenging chip just simply because it has uh, four sides. You got to line things up in the X and Y axis just perfectly to make certain all the legs align on the pads. And if I couldn't get this right, it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense doing everything else as well. On the bottom right of this image right here, you can see the size of the RAM solder pads, which are double or quadruple the size of the, the pads for the legs on the Xilinx chip. So how did I do this? I pinned down a leg on, op, not opposite sides, but adjacent sides, opposite corners, you could say, in order to try to pin down the X and the Y axis. Uh, once I got that down, I simply used a drag solder approach on the sides that didn't have the pinned legs so that I wouldn't move things around when I applied some heat to the, the pinned legs specifically and uh, had some joined legs. It happened. Uh, but I was able to clear them out relatively quickly using magnification like you see here. This is an example of the final photo of, of each side here. And, uh, and look for, look for join pins, clear them out individually little by little, and then check for shorts, right? Using my, uh, multimeter, checking each individual pin, making sure I didn't have any that were joined together. Honestly, I spent the most time shifting this chip around back and forth in order to get it to line up properly on each of the pads on all, all directions, right? I get one side perfect. And then it'd be slightly ski wampus, or I get two sides that look like they're they're aligned properly. I, I think I spent probably a good half an hour just trying to line this. And, and to be fully transparent, I'm no expert at this. This is the first time I've 
I've done this successfully. I tried this a few years ago with a terrible Fire 536. Failed miserably, did a terrible job, and ended up destroying the Xilinx chip. So this was a kind of Hail Mary in, in my books is to try to make sure I could get this built. The biggest advice for someone who's doing this for the first time that I would have that helped me out the most, and I, and I learned this from watching others doing this, right, was pinning down different legs first. That helped me. Others, I'm sure there's others who can do a much better job of this than me, but what helped me out the most was to pin those opposite corner legs to pin it in the X and Y axis so that it wouldn't keep shifting around and moving. The next chip I soldered on was the first RAM chip here, the first of the 64 megabytes of TT RAM, fast RAM that's on this board. Were I to do it again, I would not have done the, this, this chip first. And, and what you'll see is I actually moved on to the buffer chips after this, after I realized I, I could, again, the buffer chips are a little harder than the RAM chips because of the, the finer pitch. And so it makes sense in my mind to do the, the buffer chips next. As I mentioned, I moved from that first RAM chip to the buffer chips here. And these four buffer chips uh, were a little harder than the RAM uh, just because of the finer pitch on the legs, but also because they're smaller and lighter and they shift around a lot easier, right? They, they wiggle a little bit. You apply any pressure to them and they just quickly move a little bit. But they are easier than the Xilinx chip because you didn't have to worry about the four sides of the chip to, work, to, to line up. You only had to line up both two sides, the two opposite, opposing sides. And as you can see, the, the three on the right, those lined up just dead nuts, perfect, great. The furthest one to the left, if you look closely at the image, you can see that it's at a bit of an angle. And that's just because as I applied some pressure to it, a little bit of pressure, when I was soldering the legs on, it just shifted ever so slightly. And I, there was no issues with it. I've tested it out, or I had tested it out. Obviously, it's working because this is retroactive recording of the audio. But as you can see, it was a little, a little fiddly. So the last SMD component to solder the board was the second RAM chip. And it was relatively easy, had a much coarser pitch than any of the other components. And just pinning the two quarters together and doing the drag solder technique, it worked out just fine. It, it wasn't perfect the first, first time through, had to clean up some different connected pins. You might even see some in this image here, but it all worked down in the end. All right, just taking a step back to admire my surface mount soldering skills. It looks good. We still have a number of through hole components to solder in. I'll go through each of those uh, eventually. Bottom right corner, there's another surface mount thing, that, uh, socket that I can solder in. I am not going to solder it in uh, for a number of reasons I'll describe later. Uh, on the bottom side of the board, and I don't ever have any, I don't have any pictures of it at the moment, but there's a number of small components, capacitors, resistors, uh, an oscillator as well. These are the bird seed effectively uh, came assembled on this board as it was. Okay, so now I solder in the various different headers on the bottom right hand of the board. These are various different jumpers for pulling in different kinds of ROMs as well as disabling, enabling MMU and cache. Moving on to the next part, this is also soldering the programming pins. These are the, the pins that are required in order to program the Xilinx chip. All right, now soldering in the CPU socket. Uh, it's keyed, so it, you can't really get it in wrong. So it worked out just fine there as well. All right, the last components that I'm soldering in or soldered in here, uh, on the upper side of the board, or what's on the upper side of the board here is the uh, CPU socket pins, and to the right of those is the IDE header pins. I solder upside down, and the reason why I solder upside down is because it will not fit in the Atari 520ST case with it right side up. So by do, and I also have to adjust the SD card reader in order to make certain that it also can receive the same signal, proper signals. Done testing before. I've done this before. Um, it, it works just fine, but it's necessary in order to fit in the case. Also at this time, this is when I programmed the Xilinx chip. And I did that using the Raspberry Pi that you see up top. Uh, there's some great directions by Linux Jedi. Uh, this is a Raspberry Pi Zero that I used, how to connect it up, the headers, etc., how to run the software and programs, etc. Linux Jedi has a great uh, instruction manual on how to do this. 
uh, it really helped out perfectly. I tried actually using my Raspberry Pi 5 first, and I'm not sure why it wasn't working properly, but when I switched over to the Pi Zero, boom, it was in a heartbeat, worked out just fine. Also, you see in the upper right-hand corner, I, I had a backup plan that if the uh, ROM decoder that's already in the 520ST didn't work, that I could solder on a, a socket for that ROM chip, that the PLCC ROM chip there. All right, here we are getting ready to test. This is installed. As you can see, the SD card reader has been connected, and it's connected on the underside. This is a modified SD card reader that I've used before. Uh, also, you see on this picture uh, the TOS decoder that's underneath. It's actually got a battery backed up clock in it as well. Again, there's some reasons why I wanted to keep that guy. I also have more ROM chips <laughs> that work with this, this board as well. So if I want to change something in the future, I can do that as well. Okay, we're at the point now where the ST536 is installed in the 520ST. I've run through all the rigmarole. One of, one of the things that hasn't been done yet, I have not soldered the ROM chip and the ROM socket on here as of yet because I didn't have it at the time, but I do have a ROM decoder and I could solder, or I could not solder, I could burn the modified TOS 2.06 onto this chip here. It's working. It works flawlessly with the Ultra Satan here. I'll show you what happens with the IDE at the moment. And from reading on the forums, this is the Exos forum, there are issues with SD card adapters. It's a little finicky from an IDE perspective. Uh, recommendation is to use a CF card instead. I had just gotten an adapter, but I want to show you just kind of the, the symptom here. And, and the way I started finding this out, right, so having both the, this IDE installed actually even without the, without the ultrasate installed it just has it has problems with repeated write activities on the on the disk read activity seem to work just flawlessly it's writing to this uh the sd card or writing to this drive or whatever you want to put it um is what causes the issues and basically causes the computer to reboot what how i'm going to show you how this works is i have the ultrasate set up with this secondary drive, this is not a boot drive, it's a um, <laughs> drive. It's a drive, it's, it's a CF card that has been partitioned with HD driver to be Windows and TOS compatible. So that allows me to copy files onto this SD card from my PC and then copy program software, etc., onto this this um, drive SD card that has been partitioned for only being Atari SD toss. You have to do that in order to make this bootable by the system. A lot of prefacing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We'll, we got this powered on. We'll power on the monitor over here. Get the screen on. And I have been able to copy a couple of files and programs onto it just fine. I love this. Now, here's a little refresh issue, whatever you want to call it. It's still, it, it looks gorgeous here. Sorry about the flicker. Uh, as you can see, it's a custom ROM. I love the ST536. Thank you, Exos, for making that. I think that's just, it's so cool. Just skip through that. So it's detecting the Ultra Satan as well as the SD card reader there. We have all these drives here. These are just the drives associated with the SD card on the IDE connection. What I'm going to do now, this is a cool part of TOS 2.06. We're going to go up to here and click on install. Let me zoom in. Maybe that'll get rid of some of the flicker. Nah. It looks terrible, but we're just going to click on install devices. What will happen is it installs the M and N drives here. Those are the, the drives on the Ultra Satan. There, this guy here with all the files I want to copy from Windows over. 
if I boot just from the Ultra Satan, uh, it works perfectly. And full read, write, etc. It's it's literally the ID. So it's it, in my mind, it has more. To, I, the more likely situation from a troubleshooting perspective is that it is the SD card reader and not the drive itself, or, or the not the drive, but it, it's the drive itself and not the, the ST536 that has the issues. All right, so what we're gonna do here is I'm just gonna do a quick copy of, let's do civilization. And we'll copy this to the D drive. What you'll see is it'll start copying just fine, and then it'll flash. It'll bomb out. Yeah, there we go. Just crashed out. What we'll do now is we'll just reboot the computer. And I'll show you running and reading, reading Frontier Bench. We'll do that. Actually, and I will turn off the Ultra Satan. We'll just boot directly from the IDE. There we go. We're up again. All right. So we are at the desktop. We're gonna to go to the D drive. As you can see, I've tried copying some stuff over. It's missing a lot of the files. It only has 30 of about 150 whatever or so files that are required. We'll run Frontier. This is Frontier Bench. So the reason why I'm running this and just kind of showing you this is this that, first off, it's working great. But what isn't working great, or it's working great, and it also reads perfectly fine. Large files, large amounts of data, etc. As you can see, it is crazy smooth, working wonderfully. Okay, I'm tired of the flicker, flickeriness. We're just gonna power you off. All right, the next thing is, so as I kind of described earlier, one of the things that I do with the Atari 520ST, so this, this board is to be in the Atari 520ST, is I have the ID header going downward. The reason is, is it doesn't fit. It, the, it doesn't fit in the case if it pops out at the top, right? It'll interfere with the keyboard. So by having it go downward, I actually can fit everything in the case, which is exactly what I want to do. The problem with that is that I have to adapt the board, the uh, the SD card reader, CF card reader, uh, to also match up the pins wise, because you have to actually, these are designed to have the pin headers going up. So in order to swap them around, I put go the opposite on this side, I have to go the opposite on this side, it works. <laughs> it obviously works. It, I just pin out all the pins, make sure they're going to the right places uh, on both boards, pin, uh, highlighting pin one specifically. So I just got a new CF card reader from the Amazon. I have a CF card. I have, I have this one here. This one is just in case I need another one. A brand new CF card to use in this guy. So we're going to adapt it and get it working. But before we do that, what I wanna do is I actually do wanna show, we're gonna remove this drive here and simply show that the Ultra Satan works flawlessly, both reads and writes. All right, there we go. They're both in. We'll get back to the flickery mess of the screen Seriously, again, I love the custom image here. I think that's so cool. I think that was you that made that access, right? This is your ROM, modified ROM. Let's 
shows nothing on the, under the IDE. As you can see, it's booting from, not from the IDE, but from the Ultra Satan. And let's see if it boots Mint just fine. It might, it might not. I haven't, no, it doesn't, doesn't boot it just fine. It just boots the regular desktop. But we can just install the devices. As you can see, I don't have a floppy drive here. I just copied everything over uh, from a, another image. Uh, obviously, it's not perfect, but kind of cool nonetheless. Um, let's just do, so the M, or what number, what letter? M and N. Yeah, M and N are the, so the M and N are the secondary SD card in the Ultra Satan. So we'll just do a quick write action, similar kind of thing. We're just going to copy the game video game Empire to the H drive. And it will not reboot and will not reset the computer. So again, the ASCI port is working flawlessly. The IDE, I, I still think that it has to do with uh, just the, the the reader. And and based upon the errors I was seeing, I'm seeing here, I've seen other comments on the Exos forum that were ex experiencing the exact same thing. They switched to a CF card reader. It worked fine. All right. We'll get to building up that CF card reader. Okay. So one of the things I need to do, uh, the SD card did not, SD card reader did not work with the ST536. The recommendation is to use a CF card adapter. That's what this is. Now, one of the things I do still need to do, let me open this guy up. This just barely arrived. Hopefully I can find the way to open, there we are. There's still one more thing I have to do because what I did with this ST536 is the same thing I did with the TF536. In order to fit it in the 520ST case, I had to put the IDE connector upside down, effectively. And that changes the connections here. It's not just simply plugging in the cable backwards. They're actually inverted up and uh, top and bottom, at least from the way this is done here. Left and right, top and bottom, whatever you want to refer to it. So what I have to do is remove this connector here and then replace it with one that's on the bottom of it. We have this done. The next step is then to clear out the, the holes with some solder braid. What we have here is we have the new connector. Just solder it on the back side. Let's do that. Should I get this over here? A little bit of light. There we go. Just get a couple pins in first. Just make sure it's flush. I need to push this side down a little bit. There we go. Better, much better. Okay, then I will just solder in the rest of the pins and we'll go to the next Okay, we set. have the CF card reader installed. We have the pin to pin, proper pin connections. I've done the continuity check there. We have HD driver on the floppy disk there. Let's power on.
Good sign, the flashcard is lit up. Let's see if it detects it properly. And doesn't give some random weird mews or cues or whatever. Yes, CF card. <laughs> yes, that is awesome. And it detects a drive. That right there is awesome. Now, I still have to obviously install the drivers. All right, I've tried to get rid of some of that flicker by adjusting the frame rate capture on my, my phone's camera. But as you can see, I've partitioned this CF card into 10 distinct partitions of 500 megabytes each, which is what you, what you want to do with TOS 2.0 or 2.6 or earlier. So we just got to restart it to activate the system. And after doing that, then I install the HD driver, the hard disk driver onto the, onto one of the partitions to make it the boot partition. Once that is HD.sys or HD driver, .sys, something like that is what it puts on there. It allows it to boot on its own without a floppy disk. There we go, you can see all the, the all 10 drives. And then we're done setting it up. And then we gotta work on uh, testing out transferring files back and forth to it. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna attach the, connect the Ultra Satan to this and start copying some files from one of the Ultra Satan drives that I have. All right, so what I do is I just select, I'm gonna select the C drive because that's, I usually make that my boot drive. Install the HD driver. Bada bing, bada bang, and we're good. What I like to do, so I'm just gonna quit out of this and then I'm gonna reboot the computer without the floppy disk in the disk drive to verify that the hard disk driver is working properly on, on the hard drive itself. Actually, we'll even power off the, no, we won't power off the floppy drive. We'll leave it on, but just take the disk out. So, disk is out relying on the hard disk only. And it's detected it, perfect, booted from it. Now what I'm gonna do, we're gonna set some preferences here, medium resolution. I always like to boot in medium resolution on the hard drive just to get a little more space on the desktop. I'm gonna turn off the cache, set the desktop, that's the first test. And we'll check the hard disk. So we have hdriver.sys and new desk.inf. That is the desktop environment. Perfect. Okay, the next thing I want to do, let's do this. We'll install all devices. All 10 drives are installed. I'm, I'll make it pretty later, but I just like to just get this all set up to begin with. All right, I'll get the Ultra Satan and let's look at, take a look at uh, transferring files now. We are ready to go. Ultra Satan is connect, connected up. This right here, this is the boot drive or SD card, whatever you want to call it, micro SD card. This one over here is the storage one. And this is this one's set up and formatted or partitioned as TOS only. This one here is at Windows and, and TOS. I, I think I probably mentioned it before, but you cannot use the install or boot from a TOS Windows compatible partition. So you have to have it set up as a TOS partition. So we're gonna use this TOS Windows partition to transfer files back and forth from PC and then also onto this CF card here. All right, that's powered on. And it should detect it just fine. Yep, detected the Ultra Satan. What we're gonna do now is we're just gonna install the, the other two devices, the other two drives. These are the Windows TOS compatible ones, right? M and N. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take D. D is kind of the, I always like to use C as the boot drive, D as my primary games storage drive. We're just gonna copy over Oh, my favorite, Ultima 5. Or, uh, yeah, Ultima 5. Did I have Ultima 4 over here? I thought I had Ultima 4. Yeah, Ultima 4. We'll copy Ultima 4 over. 
and see if it causes the system to reboot. Okay, this is very promising. It would usually reset after just about 10 files and just cause a crash as you saw earlier. This is just making me so excited. Yes. <laughs> oh, I am stoked. Oh, I, I am so stoked. All right, L last step. We have to boot up Ultima 4 from the CF card now. Obviously, you know, I still have to button the thing up and make sure it fits in nicely and doesn't cause issues with inside the computer that everything pops off or whatnot. Oh, it's medium resolution doesn't like to work the hard drive, so it's going to show up. Yeah, it's going to be distorted. Eh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Another lesson in the hard drive adapted games. <laughs> they're, they're, they are awesome. People put so much work into them and I'm so grateful for them. But they can be a little finicky and quirky occasionally. This being one of them. You have to switch the resolution of the desktop to low resolution to boot. All right. I am, like I said, so stoked. Especially that I get to hear Ultima. Ultima 4. I am going to transfer a whole crap ton of files and you don't need to watch that part of it and then button this thing back up, get it all hooked up back together and then I'll close this video out. Well, I also got to get another uh, ribbon cable and install that guy back into the Amiga 500. Thank you for joining me on this journey, getting this ST536 up and working. This has been a bit of a stressful journey. <laughs> it's been exciting, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted that everything worked out in the end, right? Three years ago or so, I tried building a terrible Fire 536 and failed miserably. Destroyed the, the number of components, did a terrible job, right? I've progressed, learned more, and it's exciting to see this working now and actually getting it done. It's, thank, it's awesome. Uh, and then I do also want to thank Exos and Terrible Fire for the work they've done to make these things possible. These are definitely passion projects. I, I, uh, I'm grateful for those who are com contributing to the community, donating of their time and effort to make these things happen. Terrible Fire for designing the base Terrible Fire 536 as well as all the other boards that he's worked on. And then Exos for adapting that Terrible Fire 536 to the ST536. He also recently released an alpha, I think it's an alpha version of an STE 536, which is uh, actually in many ways even cooler. Hopefully I'll be able to get my hands on one and build one myself or maybe someone will build them and I can buy one from somebody who's already built it so I don't have to go through the stress again. But the cool thing about that one is um, with the Atari STs, none of them that I have ever worked on have the CPU, the DIP 64 pin socket or chip, the, the CPU, CPU chip in a socket. They're non-socketed, so you have to add a socket in order to do anything like this to it, right? Whereas a large majority of the STEs, the CPU, the 68000, is socketed. And so this makes this chip or this accelerator board, the STE536, likely more of a plug and play situation. It's never plug and play exactly, but <laughs> much more plug and play than this was. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. I'll put in the comments below uh, the forums, the Exos forum information. If you wanna buy a board, an ST536 board, where to get that, as well as the bill of material instructions, the ROMs, the firmware, blah, 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 all that stuff there, as well as the STE 536. All right. Thank you so much for watching again. Appreciate it greatly. Have a fantastic day. Later.